Good morning, everyone. Switch down the TV today. There was no surprise, just the same old thing. There was war and crime, and sex and drugs, and greed like I've never seen. The more I watched, the more I got mad as the talking heads kept babbling on. But then a man came on, and spoke so nice. He said he's gonna make this world a better place. He's gonna give us peace, give us our money, be our friend, and give us all some peace of mind. Yeah, I don't believe a word he's saying. Oh no, no, I ain't buying what he's selling. Oh no, no, he can't save our homes and nation, but only one can. Only one that's Jesus. I vote for Jesus because he's the one who can stop our war. He's the one who can save our land. He's the one who can heal our wounds. He's the only one that we can trust. Vote for Jesus. I vote for Jesus. Yeah. So I'm sitting there watching this song and dance As the man tells me how it's gonna be He's gonna give us this and give us that And help us all to fulfill our dreams He's gonna make us great once again And lead us all to a better day, yeah I don't believe a word he's saying Oh no, no I ain't buying what he's selling Oh no, no He can't save our homes and nation But only one can Only one that's Jesus I vote for Jesus Because he's the one who can stop our war He's the one who can save our land He's the one who can heal our wounds He's the only one that we can trust Vote for Jesus I vote for Jesus Yeah, 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 vote for Jesus I vote for Jesus Yeah Because he's the one who can stop our war He's the one who can save our land He's the one who can heal our wounds He's the only one that we can trust Vote for Jesus I vote for Jesus Yeah, 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 vote for Jesus I vote for Jesus Yeah, 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 vote for Jesus Be right back, let me hang up the guitar and I'll be with you in a sec Good morning again. Good to, to have you all with us. Could you turn in your Bibles to the Epistle of Jude? Go to Jude verse 1. Epistle of Jude, and we're going to wrap up our study today of Jude verse 7 by noting uh, the emphasis of Jude verses 5 through 7. And this will constitute our 31st hour in this epistle. So glad to have you all with us. And as we normally do, we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father because any mental, verbal, or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. 
we maintain that fellowship uh, by obeying the Spirit, who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit, and Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. Now we need to confess our sins as Christians because of fellowship. Uh, our eternal relationship with God is... Um, we need to know the distinctions between our eternal relationship with God and fellowship with God. Our eternal relationship with God is uh, not affected by sin one iota, but uh, our fellowship is. So, when, uh, and also we have, as Christians, we still have a sin nature, and God, can, God is still holy. He doesn't change. God is light. So we need to confess our sins for that reason, because we s still sin, and He's still holy. And, uh, and so people get a little confused about the forgiveness of sins, in a positional sense, we have the forgiveness of our sins. In a perfective sense, we have a forgiveness of sins and our resurrection bodies will be perpetually experiencing those forgiveness of sins. At our positionally, at our justification, we receive the forgiveness of sins and that, that set up the potential for us to experience the forgiveness of sins when we confess our sins after sinning. So there's uh, very important that uh, we understand the, uh, the uh, forgiveness of sins in those three areas. And it corresponds to our salvation and sanctification which are also in three stages so very very important uh, time now because we can't understand and apply uh, what's being taught by the spirit and through the communication of the word of god if we're out of fellowship as christians and if we just refuse to confess our sins we will be disciplined by god and so uh, because he loves us from his attribute of love he does this so if there's anything that's, anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another day to study your word and to gather together with other members of the body of Christ online and uh, to uh, fellowship in your word. We thank you for this week's classes that you've given to us. I pray that we use them mightily along with this one today. And I just thank you for the technology, the people taking advantage of it. We pray there'll be no problems with the recording, the video, and the audio and the upload of these uh, recording and video and audio to our various websites and podcasts and media platforms that you've given to us. And I pray you would use those mightily. I also uh, pray that your people in the audience, thank you for them again. I pray, Father, that by the part of Spirit, help them to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction, to concentrate, to be able to understand and apply what they're being taught by the power of the Spirit so that they can continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is your Son, of course. I also pray for those who might be non-Christians in the audience. I pray, Father, for them that by the power of the Spirit, they'll be able to understand the gospel so that they can make a decision to either accept or reject your Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior. We know that you desire all people to, to uh, be saved and come to an experiential knowledge of the truth. I also pray for myself today, by the power of the Spirit, help me to communicate your full counsel to your people with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power so I can minister to your people and any non-Christians in the audience. And I also pray that you would help me as well to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction. And so, Father, we pray for this service and our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. If you haven't turned there already, please go to the Epistle of Jude. Go to Jude verse 1. Jude verse 1, we're going to read from the Net Bible, and then uh, we're going to um, look at my translation of the first seven verses, and then uh, we'll look at verses, we'll talk about today our lesson will be the, the emphasis. We'll talk about the emphasis of Jude verses 5 through 7. So very, very important class uh, today. Uh, they're all important. I say that all the time, don't I? I just look at the, listen to the playbacks all the time. Like, every class is important, and every every study is fun in my book. It's the Word of God, so hopefully you feel the same way. So uh, let's look at Jude verse one. I'll read from the Net Bible, and you can see it on the board. Jude verse one from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to those who are called, wrapped in the love of God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be lavished on you. Dear friends, although I've been eager to write to you about our common salvation, I now feel compelled instead to write to encourage you to contend earnestly for the faith 
that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men have secretly slipped in among you, men who long ago were marked out for the condemnation I'm about to describe, ungodly men who have turned the grace of our God into a license for evil and who deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I desire to remind you, even though you've been fully informed of these facts once for all, that Jesus, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, later destroyed those who did not believe. You also know that the angels who did not keep within their proper domain, but abandoned their own place of residence, he has kept in eternal chains and utter darkness, locked up for the judgment of the great day. So also Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring towns, since they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire in a way similar to these angels, are now displayed as an example by suffering the punishment of eternal fire. Now, if you could look at my translation uh, on the board, of course, you would think I had it up there. I thought I did have it up there today earlier. And I went to, when I prepared the lessons, uh, well, they've been prepared well in advance. Uh, let me see. Here it is. It's over here. Sorry about that. All right. Jude verse 1 in my translation. We'll read the first seven verses again in my translation, which again, I say this all the time. It reflects my interpretation. All translations are interpretive and some more than others. Mine is definitely by deliberately uh, is more interpretive because I'm trying to interpret for my people and sometimes my translation might seem a little bit wordy and uh, and uh, so uh, that's because or it's you know, a lot of people call it an expanded translation so uh, there's a reason why I do that and uh, is to bring out as much as I could my interpretation of this particular uh, book and uh, also remember all my uh, all these lessons that we've done whatever the book we've ever done in the past and this one uh, we'll have uh, an exegesis and exposition in written format and PDF format on our Wenstrom.org site as well as our Academia EDU website. And I go into exhaustive detail and explain my translation and interpretation. So uh, if, if you're looking for even uh, more in, uh, more um, detail as far as how I come to these translations. And I try to explain them as I go along in, in our studies here with you online, but I don't want to get, I'm not trying to teach a Greek class or, you know, Greek syntax or whatever, or Hebrew syntax. So now let's look at Jude verse one in my translation again. From Jude, a slave owned by Jesus Christ, as well as James' brother, to those who exist in the state of being loved by God, who is your father. Therefore, to those who are the effectually called ones, who are existing in the state of being kept, in the state of being protected by and for the benefit of Jesus Christ, may divine compassion be increasingly experienced by each one of you so as to increasingly experience divine peace as well as to increasingly experience divine love. That's the introduction to the letter. And uh, here we have the beginning of the body of the letter. In verse 3, Beloved, Although I prepared myself with utter diligence to communicate in writing for the benefit of each one of you regarding our common salvation, I have entered into the state of experiencing compulsion to communicate in writing for the purpose of exhorting and encouraging each and every one of you at this particular time to make it your habit of exerting intense effort for your own benefit on behalf of the faith that that body of doctrine the church believes in, which has been delivered once and never again for the benefit of the saints. And here's the reason why they need to contend for the faith. For certain people have joined all of you surreptitiously with evil intent, specifically those who long ago are written about beforehand with regards to the same type of judgment I'm about to describe. That would be in verses 5 through 16. They are ungodly who are exchanging, experiencing the grace of our God to justification by faith in Jesus for practicing criminal behavior. And consequently, they are refusing to follow the one and only master, namely our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm prompted to desire to cause each and every one of you to be reminded, even though each of you are possessing a thorough knowledge about each of these examples in verses 5, 6, and 7, that Jesus, sometime after having delivered the people out from the land that is Egypt, destroyed those who would not believe. Correspondingly, he is keeping by means of eternal chains under the control of total supernatural darkness for the purpose of executing the judgment during the great day of those who ended in the state of not keeping their own sphere of activity, but rather, in fact, abandon their own place of habitation. Verse 7. Similarly, in a manner like these angels, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the citizens of the cities around them, caused themselves to be publicly set forth as an example, namely because they're experiencing a righteous punishment, which is experiencing eternal fire because they committed immorality, specifically because they pursued after homosexual activity. Now, for the benefit of those who are new to the study, because we're always getting new people uh, coming into our studies all the time, and for those of you who are following faithfully with the teaching, this is good review for you. And uh, because you don't get everything I say the first time, nobody does that. And that's why I repeat. 
And so uh, we see that this book was written approximately sometime after 62 AD, after the death of James, who was the brother of Jude. And James and Jude were half-brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, James was killed, according to Anna, uh, Josephus, uh, by Ananias. And uh, so uh, this was a very tumultuous decade for the Jews. Um, we see that in 66 to 70 AD, uh, the, led by the Jewish zealots, uh, Judea rebelled against Rome and they were destroyed. Uh, in 70 AD by Titus and his Roman legions, they destroyed the city of Jerusalem and the temple and deported the people throughout the Roman Empire. And also many of them, the captives, Jewish captives, were brought into the city uh, through uh, during uh, uh, Titus's triumphal procession into Rome. And an artist's depiction of that event is on the Arch of Titus in Rome today. You can probably go online and see that. And so uh, these individuals that Jude is uh, uh, concerned about that have gone into the Christian meaning surreptitiously are the Jewish zealots of the first century AD. They were uh, came about through Judas uh, the Galilean. He was killed by the Romans. And uh, they, the, the Jewish zealots, constituted the four, one of four great pillars in Jewish society in the first century AD. Of course, as we mentioned before, the Jewish, uh, the, we had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We see them in the Gospels. Then we have the Essenes down in the Dead Sea Scroll, a Dead Sea area, and the Dead Sea Scrolls bear witness to them, as well as Josephus does and other people during that period. Uh, we also see that also we have the Jewish zealots. They believe in the sole rule of God, like the Maccabeans in the second century uh, B.C., who uh, uh, rebelled against Antiochus Epiphanes IV, they were zealous for the law. And uh, they believed that, uh, the, that uh, there was the sole rule of God. That means that they didn't believe that they had to obey uh, the uh, Emperor Vespasian uh, they, or any Roman ruler. And so they rebelled against them. They believed that uh, in, the, in the book of Daniel that the fourth beast was Rome, and they were right. Unfortunately, they failed to see that, uh, and they would have known this if they obeyed the teaching of Jesus and the apostles, that they would have, and the Holy Spirit would be given to them if they trusted in Jesus as Savior. Uh, they uh, failed to see that the ten horns and the little horn of the, on that fourth beast constitute the final stage of the Roman Empire under the Antichrist. And it was during that period, in the future, during the 70th week of Daniel, that the Messiah would come back to establish the kingdom of God on earth. So these Jewish zealots were trying to persuade the citizens of Judea, and they eventually were successful, according to Josephus, and uh, causing the people to rebel against Rome. And it ended in, in great defeat. And so we also see that uh, they were infiltrating the Christian meetings because they were trying to s persuade the people in the Christian meetings uh, to join them in this revolt. And so this was very dangerous to the Christian community because by getting involved in this revolt, they would be going against God and they'd be rebelling against him and the delegated authorities that he's given them. See, uh, we see that uh, we look at uh, how... Uh, these zealots were rebelling against the Roman and Jewish civil authorities. Uh, and uh, so they were actually rebelling against God because God has ordained this uh, governmental authorities. And we also saw during the times of the Gentiles, the Jews would be under the, the uh, Gentile powers. And the gen times of the Gentiles don't end until the 70th week of Daniel, by the second advent of Christ, when, which ends the 70th week of Daniel and the times of the Gentiles. They began with Nebuchadnezzar's attack on Jerusalem and 586 B.C. So we see that uh, the, 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 the Jewish zealots, by rebelling against uh, Rome, they were rebelling against God who uh, decreed, uh, delegated authority to the governmental authorities of Rome to rule over Judea. They also, and people forget about this, this is why you see what, why Jews says what he says in verse 9 when he mentions Michael the elect angel not making a slanderous accusation against Satan, respecting the authority of Satan. Satan, the fallen angels, currently at this time, ever since the fall, have authority over the nations, temporary authority over the nations. Remember, Jesus was uh, offered, the t was tempted by the devil with, that he would be able to, he'd give him the, Satan says, I'll give you these kingdoms. Now, that wouldn't be a temptation if he actually could not do it. But he did have that authority given to him by God, and he was you know, trying to tempt Christ to, uh, you know, um, basically go uh, and worship him, and he would give him the authority of the nations, and uh, and uh, and then uh, just for so that uh, the Lord would worship him, and of course he rebu rebu rebuked him with the word of God. So uh, we see that by uh, rebelling against the Jewish, uh, the Roman uh, civil authorities, they would be re rebelling against Satan and his delegated authority that God had given him. 
And so remember, Satan is the god of this world. First Corinthians, uh, first uh, Second Corinthians four four, and First John five nineteen says he's the whole world's under his power, and uh, we also see that uh, he is uh, deceives the entire world. So we see that by getting involved by the the Christian community in Judea, who are the recipients of this epistle, getting involved in this revolt. Uh, they would be uh, going against God. They'd be rebelling against him. That's the whole issue of this epistle. Not false teachers, as I said many times. Uh, the, 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 there's no reference, explicit reference to false teachers. And, and secondly, there's no description of the nature of their teaching. And that's very significant. And, uh, you know, Second Peter 2, which is taken from Jude. Many people think that Jude is talking about false teachers. And I was used to be one of them. And that's the predominant view. But, uh, but Peter makes clear that he's talking about the opponents in his letter are actually false teachers. And so uh, we see that that's not the case in the epistle of Jude. And very important as well, very important. I can't stress this enough. There's no description of the nature of their teaching. Remember 1 John? John identifies the opponents as Antichrist. And he also says, he describes the nature of their teaching in that epistle, which was docetic Gnosticism. They rejected the human nature of Christ. You don't see that here. So it's a Jewish problem here. It's not the Judaizers because the Judaizers were actually Jewish Christians who were trying to put Gentile Christians under the law. We know that from, not only the book of Galatians, but explicitly from Acts 15. And so that's not going on here because these people in this letter are described as unbelievers throughout the letter. And I brought this out in the past and I'll bring it out again. So they're unbelievers. They're unregenerate people. They're Jew There's a Jewish problem because they're Jewish too. So what was going on at the time of James wrote this letter? Historically, it was these Jewish zealots. And actually, uh, you know, there's a, the, the, it's very interesting if you look at the Gospels in, in the book of Acts, different areas, it's kind of, a, there's, there was a messianic movement, great messianic movement at the time Jesus showed up. And there was also a great, uh, the, the freedom fighters, freedom movement led by the zealots were trying to uh, free uh, Ju uh, uh, Jerusalem and, and Judah uh, from the uh, the Roman Empire and the the Gentiles, but that flew that was against the the Word of God. So listen to me. This also is very important too. That these Jewish zealots, uh, they they rejected they they believed that they had to attack the, the the Gentiles, the Romans, in order to prompt the Messiah to come back. That's what Josephus says that they believed, and uh, and Martin Hengel in his great book on the zealots describes that in greater detail for us. So. That's against the teaching of Jesus and the apostles and the Old Testament because the Old Testament and Jesus and the apostles said that Jesus, the Messiah, he would establish the kingdom of God on earth by himself through the exercise of his divine omnipotence at his second advent. And these Jewish zealots were therefore, by their actions, they were going against the Lord Jesus Christ and Christian teaching, which originates from the Spirit and the Father. So this is extremely important subject because the application is for the Christian community today you, got, you cannot rebel against the, the civil authorities unless you have justification biblically. As we pointed out in the past, in our study of the book of Daniel and other books, uh, there are, there are uh, according to the Bible, uh, times when it's justified to rebel against the governmental authorities. We don't have any conditions like that in our country today. So, I'll give you some examples. We did it in the past. Uh, the Hebrew midwives, they rejected and uh, Pharaoh's uh, decree to kill the Jewish baby boys. And uh, they actually lied to that, him that they, uh, uh, about why they couldn't do that in order to protect these Jewish baby boys. So that's justified civil disobedience. Uh, then we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, in, in response to the, the vision he was given in, in Daniel chapter 2, uh, he, cre he uh, created an image in the plain of Dura and decreed that everybody in his empire worship it. Otherwise, they faced execution. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego rejected it. Because why? It's against the will of God to practice idolatry, just like it was against the will of God to murder innocent, Jew innocent people, innocent children. And then we have Daniel. He uh, was, uh, he was uh, the decree of the Persian ruler at the time, Darius. He was, uh, he was um, deceived into de making a decree from his cabinet to uh, issue a decree that nobody could pray to their God for a month unless it was him. Otherwise, if they did, they'd be executed. And that's because they were people in Darius's cabinet were jealous of, the, of Daniel. And so Daniel rebelled as against that decree because it was justified. And uh, because it, to, to, to not pray, to have the, uh, the civil leaders to say you can't pray, that would constitute 
uh, uh, being against the will of God and justified civil uh, cause for uh, disobeying the, the civil authorities. So Daniel did that. He faced execution. But like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was delivered by the pre-incarnate Christ, a Christophany. And then we have in Acts 5, uh, Peter, James, and John, the apostles, were proclaiming the gospel. And the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Jewish civil authorities at the time, uh, they said, stop doing that. And they said, we will obey God, not you. That's justified civil disobedience because it's a sin to not preach the gospel for us Christians. And so therefore we have nothing like that going on in our country. It's extremely important, especially with this up, uh, next uh, uh, election coming up. We have to be very careful as Christians that we don't want to get involved in some kind of political movement or social cause or whatever's going on in our, politically in our country that would cause us to re, uh, re, be in rebellion against God because God will judge rebellion. As we saw in, uh, in, in verses 5, 6, and 7 of Jude, uh, Jude gives three examples of people, groups of people who rebelled against God in the Old Testament that were judged by God for rebelling against Him. The Exodus generation is the first one, quite significant. They were uh, in a, uh, the apostasy, the Exodus generation, and they died the sinner to death. They're saved, yet through fire. And they have eternal security because they put the blood of the, uh, the Passover lamb on the doorpost and lintel, and their firstborns were not killed. And they also, according to 1 Corinthians 10, they went through the Red Sea with Moses, and they sprang from the same spiritual rock as us, Christ, so they were believers. So they died the sin to death, though. So if the, if the Jewish Christian community in Judea follows in this rebellion against with the zealots against Rome, then they too, like the Exodus generation, would die the sin to death and lose rewards at the Bema Seat. Then the second uh, examples in verse 6, the, we have the, the Banaha Elohim, the Genesis 6 angels, who were a certain group of angels of Satan that infiltrate, try to infiltrate the human race by possessing the bodies of unregenerate men in order to have sex with unregenerate women and procreate with them. And their offspring were not half man, half angels, but the Nephilim. The text says in Genesis that they were human beings. And the, the, so therefore, Satan was not trying to, through these angels to corrupt the, the human race uh, through, with making them all half men, half angels, but to corrupt the char character of the human race so that God would judge the world. And he did. But jo uh, Noah and his family were raised up by God who trusted in him so the human race would be able to continue. And so that was to prevent the incarnation of the Son of God from taking place because Satan knew what God said in Genesis 3.15 that a descendant of Abraham, uh, excuse me, of Adam and Eve and Abraham would uh, destroy, uh, would crush the head of Satan and Satan would, uh, would bruise the heel of the Messiah, her descendant. And of course he knew that would be his demise. 1 John 3.8, Christ destroyed the works of the devil during his first advent. And so therefore he was trying to prevent the incarnation from happening by doing what he did with these angels in Genesis 6, which also their actions are interpreted for us in Jude 6. Then in verse 7, we have uh, the, um, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah and the citizens of the cities around them, Zeboim and Admin, uh, that uh, rebelled against the Lord uh, by uh, uh, homosexual uh, behavior, as we pointed out. And there were other sins that they committed, but Jude mentions their homosexual behavior. So these are three examples of people who rebelled against the Lord and they were judged by God in the Old Testament. In verses 14 and 15, the same epistle, we're going to see in the future. I mentioned this in the past. Uh, there's a prophecy of the second advent of Christ, which is actually taken from 1 Enoch 1.9. And we see that in that passage, uh, the Lord uh, judges those who followed Antichrist in his rebellion against him during the 70th week of Daniel. Christ will judge these individuals at his second advent. And as we pointed out, with the similes in verses, the five similes in verse 13 are carried over uh, in verses 14 and 15. And this would mean that like these uh, people that will be judged by Christ at his second advent that rebelled against him under Antichrist during the 70th week, these Jewish zealots would be judged as well. And so we see here there's a, a very important lesson, rebellion ends in judgment. And if you're a believer, rebellion is going to end in uh, sin unto death which we studied in great detail. We did 1 John 5, 16 and other passages. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 29. And uh, there's warning discipline, there's intensive discipline, and then there's dying discipline. And the Exodus generation died the sin of death and because of their unrepentant rebellion. Now it's interesting. And verses 5, 6, and 7, if you look at it carefully, the text, we see in verse 5, we have mention of, the, of, of, of Jews. And in verse 7, we have mention of the of, uh, Gentiles with the Sodom and Gomorrah, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
The Jews are mentioned in verse 5. The angels are mentioned in verse 6. So we have Jews, Gentiles, and angels. They don't escape many judgment. The angels don't escape judgment when they rebel against the Lord, and neither will the Jews, and neither will the Gentiles. Everybody is accountable to God, and God deals with rebellion. He's been dealing with rebellion in the human race among the Gentiles from the very beginning after the fall, and we see that God uses evil nations to destroy other evil nations. Those who studied Daniel with me and Habakkuk with me know what I'm talking about here. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon to destroy uh, the kingdom of Judah and Assyria to destroy the northern kingdom of Israel for their apostasy and the other nations that were uh, for unregenerate and rejected uh, the Lord unrepentantly uh, in the Mediterranean, Mesopotamian regions of the world. And then Medo-Persia destroyed Babylon, another evil nation. Then Alexander's Greece destroyed Medo-Persia, another evil nation destroying another evil nation. And then you have Rome destroying uh, Greece. And then on and on it goes. The, so God deals with, I mean, where's Hitler's Germany today, people? Where, where's Stalin's Russia? Where's Putin's going to be? It's going to be gone too. And if we're not careful, the United States is following the same path, okay? The same path of these other nations. Stop saying that we're a Christian nation. We're not even close to being a Christian nation. There's only one nation, people, on the face of the earth that is a theocracy. It's not the United States. It wasn't Great Britain. It's Israel. Only Israel is given God's law and his constitution. You know, God is chose Israel out of all the nations. And from Israel, the Messiah would come. And he would, through, the, through, uh, through the Jews, he would, he would uh, get the gospel out. The, all the apostles and Jesus were Jewish, were they not? So we see that uh, God j deals with rebellion. He hates rebellion and he deals with it. Now, just because God doesn't uh, immediately execute the sentence doesn't mean he's not going to ex immediately execute the sentence. Satan is a case of point in that. Satan's sentence has not been executed yet. Matthew 25, 41 says that he has been sentenced to the lake of fire, but he's not there yet because he's still the God of this world, it says. And it says in Revelation 19, 20, he's not going to be removed from this earth for a thousand years until the second advent of Christ. Then he's released after the thousand years for a brief time. Starts another rebellion with members of unregenerate members of the human race that's put down, then his sentence is executed. Uh, Revelation 20, verses 10 through 15 teaches us that. So uh, you might think you're getting away with something, but you're not. And uh, you're not. And none of us are getting away with anything. We're going to be held accountable by the Lord because he's holy. And if you're an unregenerate person, meaning you're not born again and saved, you haven't trusted in Jesus as Savior, uh, there, God desires you to get saved. He doesn't want to judge you. God desires the, all people to be saved and come to an experiential knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Read 2 Peter 3, 8, 9. Look at John 3, 16 through 18. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. For the Father's intention, for the Father did not send the Son of the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So during his first advent, he was trying to save people. And at the second advent, now comes the judgment. What's interesting, at the second advent of Christ, the majority of the nation of Israel will trust in Jesus Christ as Savior in contrast to his first advent. And many Gentiles will be saved during the tribulation period. And as a result of the seven seal trumpet and bowl judgments that will be poured out upon this world for their rebellion against the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is serious, serious, very applicable for our day and age here in America, for the church in America, and around the world, we must respect the, the governmental authorities, and we must not rebel unless there is, as I pointed out, biblical justification, and we don't have any conditions right now in America for that. And I say this is very important because we're coming up to another election, and there's some rumblings out there that, uh, 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 that are very bad for our country. And uh, I've mentioned them in the past before. Uh, mention of coups and whatnot by generals concerned about the climate of the political. And if there's anything hanky panky with the next election, they're going to do. They're, they're, some general said, "I'm a, and I saw it in writing. It's in, in writing. It's in the public domain that he's afraid that some there might be a, mili a coup by the military. Now, if you're in the military, do not do that. The word of God would not. If you're a Christian, do not do that. That's outrageous. You got to have biblical justification." And I've given you some examples in Scripture. So pay attention to what I'm saying here because uh, the, uh, the, you could be, as a Christian, disciplined severely by God. These Jewish zealots and those who followed them were severely disciplined. And of course, this was all about came about because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. 
and the nation was destroyed. And so Jesus predicted this, uh, and so did Daniel 9, 26. And so this is extremely important that we pay attention to these things that the Word, of, the Holy Spirit's teaching us in Scripture. So uh, it is extremely important, again, for us to remember, as I pointed out in detail in our introduction and a few moments ago, uh, that uh, the opponents in this letter were not false teachers, but rather unregenerate Jewish zealots. These zealots erroneously believed that they could bring in the kingdom of God by their own efforts, which in their view required that they fight Rome and remove her from Judea. Now this contradicted the teaching of Jesus and the apostles because Jesus Christ himself taught that he personally would bring in the kingdom at a second advent, that's Matthew 24 and 25, and read Revelation 19 and 20 as well. He would, in fact, destroy, as I mentioned before, and taught in the book of Daniel. He would, in fact, destroy the final stage of the Roman Empire at that time, which will be around during the days of the Antichrist and the, during the 70th week. And that can't take place. Those of you who study 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, and 2 Thessalonians with me, in great detail. Uh, the 2 Thessalonians 2 in particular, verses 1 through 12. The rapture, once the rapture happens, then you can have the manifestation of the Antichrist. And the, he starts the 70th week with making that treaty with Israel, according to Daniel 9.27. But he can't make it until the church is out of the way. That, so it's a pre-trib rapture, Paul's teaching. And that's quite clear from 1 Thessalonians as well. He did not, uh, he did not uh, uh, appoint you and I, 1 Thessalonians 5.9, for wrath, to experience the wrath of God during the tribulation period. Don't say the wrath in the lake of fire, because in context he's talking in, the, in 1 Thessalonians 5, the day of the Lord the 70th week. And so he didn't appoint us to experience the wrath of God during that period, but to obtain salvation. That means the perfection of our salvation at the rapture of the church when we get our resurrection body, which will perfect our salvation. So that the church, the next prophetic event that we're waiting for is the rapture, the resurrection of the church, when the church gets its resurrection bodies and their, their salvation and sanctification is perfected. And that's what we're looking for, eagerly anticipating uh, do not say that we, you know, there are some people in Christianity that they they don't teach about the rapture of all or they reject it. And then there's other people who know about it yet don't teach it. And uh, people are saying it's uh, no, it's no, um, it has no effect on the spiritual life of the believer. Are you kidding me? For those who read first, and forget me for going off the, on the, off the handle here, but that just drags me up the wall when I hear that. It's like, are you kidding me? What did Paul, uh, John talk about in First Thessalonians? Uh, excuse me, First John 3, 1 through 3. Yeah, the confident expectation of the rapture is a motivation to live the spiritual life and to keep short accounts with God by confessing your sins and obeying Him. If you thought, if you believed that Christ could come back at any moment, and He can, the imminency of the rapture of the church, for those who study the rapture with me, is huge in order for us to experience our fellowship with God and sanctification and fellowship with God and salvation experience. Because if we live in an imminent, uh, the imminent return of Christ, the rapture, we'll think twice about sinning. So don't tell me it has nothing to do with the spiritual life. Prophecy can be, in particular the rapture, is extremely important for motivating us as Christians to keep a short accounts with God and live the spiritual life. So we see that we see that the Jewish zealots were contradicting the teaching of Jesus and his apostles because Jesus, again, taught that he would personally bring in the kingdom at his second advent. He would, in fact, destroy the final stage of the Roman Empire at that time under Antichrist. Now, if the Christian community, here's the implications here, if the Christian community in Judea did not continue to adhere to the teaching of Jesus and his apostles, then they, like the unrepentant apostate members of the Exodus generation, would be disciplined by God. And if they refused to repent after being disciplined, they eventually would suffer the sin to death like these members of the ex Exodus generation did. So this is why Jude says to contend for the faith. What aspect of the faith that body of doctrine the church believes in, as we pointed out, the second advent and the doctrine of Jesus and the apostles to obey the governmental authorities unless you have biblical justification to rebel and say and, and disobey them. So that's that. Those two doctrines are what Jude is alluding to by virtue of the contents of this letter. So, there, so therefore, these three examples, which are presented in Jude verses five through seven serve as a warning to the Christian community in Judea that they must continue to adhere to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles and reject the attempts of these zealots to join them in the rebellion against Rome. And you and I in America here in the 21st century 
We need to listen to this message of the Spirit. He's warning us. He's preparing us. But I believe, I believe there's some tumultuous times yet ahead for this country. I think a lot of people see that. I don't think you have to be a, a rocket scientist to see what's going on. We got a lot of political, social, economic problems going on in our country. We got a war that could escalate and get out of hand with uh, Russia and Ukraine. You got Taiwan in danger of attack from China. China and Russia challenging America, uh, the American empire is what they're trying to do. And that's what they, 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 if they are probably trying to do this together, I would think if they were smart, they, uh, they, the only chance they really have is, is to uh, join together and attack us and to deal with us. Now, I don't think this next war, if the world war is going to be like the other two. Uh, I think there would certainly be a loss of life, uh, catastrophic probably, but, uh, but maybe not. It could be uh, we have a lot of, um, this war could take on uh, the technology-wise, trying to bring down the infrastructure of, uh, of uh, our nation. Or, you know, so there's a whole bunch of ways of waging war now that are going on actually right now as we speak. So we have to pay attention right now. We're going to be faced, we might be faced with great difficulty in this country as Christians as to, especially if it gets out of hand politically. And we have, God forbid, a, a coup that takes place. And because that would be, then we're going to really be behind the eight ball. So uh, these, the Christian community in Judea was under tremendous adversity at this particular time. And, you know, you had, um, James was assassinated. Uh, we had, uh, you know, John was still alive. Peter was, uh, Peter was about to be uh, taken, uh, arrested by Nero in the Neronian persecution in Paul in around 66 and 65 AD. And they were executed by Nero. So there's a lot of, a lot of things going on here. And so uh, that was going on in the first century AD and the Christian community was being told to adhere to Christian doctrine, stand firm on what the word of God says. Listen to me carefully, Christian whether you're a conservative Christian or a, a liberal Christian in your politics. You, some of you conservatives, are, well, there's a Christian that's liberal? Of course there are. You've got to be kidding me. That's, but you've been brainwashed. There are people like you go into that are liberal. Let's take the black community. There's a lot of pastors, Christian people in the, in the black community that are liberal in their politics. And they've been that way basically since the Kennedy administration. When Kennedy uh, called uh, Martin Luther King's wife when he was uh, running for president and he called... Uh, Loretta Scott uh, King uh, when he was in prison and they got him out. They got him out. And so from that point on, uh, Martin Luther King's father said, I'm throwing my hat in for JFK and that Nixon. And prior to that, everybody was, uh, everybody was black, was voting for the Republicans because it was Lincoln, who was a Republican, obviously, if you know your history, that freed the slaves. So from 1960 on, we've had many in the black community, not all of them, are, are, are very liberal in, the, in their politics. So there are many Christians that are liberal in their politics and believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior, and the Word of God, or profess that. And then, of course, we know in our country where the, the, the conservative Christians are very much involved in politics. And, uh, and so we have a, a warning to, to, to both groups here that uh, you, when you make a decision, when you look at you look at the world and the situation or whatever you're dealing with in life, it go your first the first place you go is the Word of God, the Word of God, not Fox or CNN or MSNBC or whatever your your liberal uh, politic political station or whatever your conservative station is you, you watch whatever it is. They don't make the decision for you. The commentators are commentators. Nobody reports the news anymore. That, you know, there's no such thing as reporters anymore. They all have to give you the news, but interpret it through the lens of the political lens that they have. Wake up and smell the coffee. A very, very bad problem in our country now. So most people think they're getting the news. No, you're getting it slanted. And you're not getting it at all because they can withhold certain things that they don't like that are going on that would, would uh, throw a monkey wrench into their, their machinery. So you keep alert on that. There are places where you can get the news that it's just reported. This is like C-SPAN, and even then, you're getting interpretations many times of what's going on in the news. People trying to tell you what this means to you. I don't need you to tell me what to do. I know what my, I know, I get the word of God, and I can make, I can have discernment and judgment of what's going on, and what I should do or shouldn't do. So we need to go back to the word of God that governs our lives. It governs our thinking, how we think, and then how we, how we do things, how we, how we're going to vote, how we're going to do everything in life. 
how we're going to raise our families, how we're going to conduct ourselves in public forum, how we, what our, whatever it is, political views are going to be on a particular thing. Now, it's interesting, you know, Jesus, you know, Jesus, you know, when they came to him and uh, remember they, you know, uh, they tried to trap him and they, you know, he said, give me the coin and whose image is on this. And he said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar and God, which is God. They were trying to find out if he actually was one of these zealots and they were trying to trap him into a political view and so that they could hang him you know, or crucify him, of course, which they did anyways. But Jesus definitely never really fell on any p political thing. You know, he had tremendous conservative right wing uh, people like led by the zealots going like crazy. And, uh, and there was a great pressure. And there's some people think that Peter was a, Simon Peter was one of was, was a zealot was involved in that at one time, but we're not really sure. But uh, these individuals were putting the pressure on the Christian community. So you and I have to be careful. Not let some political uh, uh, group get us pressured into making decisions that would fly in the face of the Word of God. This is extremely important. And this is another thing too. You know, uh, there are people out there don't like me for the reason that they, because I criticize people, pastors in particular, who are making politics, talking at the pulpit for 20 minutes on conservative or liberal politics when they should be teaching the gospel. And don't drape the American flag, don't drape the, 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 the cross and American flag. Because that's exactly what we're talking about here. You know, don't insult the God, the cross. The cross transcends political ideologies, culture, language, uh, political views. It transcends everything. It's, a, it, it, it's all inclusive in the sense that God wants to have everybody come to faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. Christianity is exclusive because there's only one way under heaven by which, which men shall be saved. That's Jesus, faith in Jesus Christ. So an exclusive in that sense, which brings about persecution for the first century saints, and right up to our day and age, we have persecution because we say there's only one way to get saved, and all these other ways are fake and of the devil. That's what drew persecution from people in the first century, and it's going to draw persecution for Christians here today. And it's getting worse. So we see that uh, uh, that political views, you know, I don't, God gave me this gift not so you could listen about my politics. And nobody knows about my politics, really. They think they, I might allude to certain things that I, that I but usually nobody sits down. I'm never going to sit down, really. There's some close friends that I would tell, okay? Because my political views are irrelevant, okay? What is most important, as I'm doing, is trying to get the gospel out. I don't, and I told this story a million times. Somebody in my congregation, when I was in Iowa, my first church plant, who worked for President Bush at the time. He was running for re-election in 2004. And, uh, and so this person asked me if I would sing for the president. Now, I said yes. I initially said no because I was petrified. <laughs> I was petrified. There's a lot of people to sing in front of the national anthem. And what a trip that was. So it was like six, 7,000 people. I'm most people I've ever played for, for in front of in my life. But uh, now if somebody was asked me to sing for President Obama's re-election, I would have done it too. Because it's, it's the President of the United States. Regardless of who the party is, it's an honor to be asked to sing for the President of the United States, whoever he is, whether he's a Democrat or Republican. I don't care what you think. I don't really, it's the office that, okay, I'm respecting the office. Now listen to me. Despite the fact that some in the office might dis disgrace it, but I have a responsibility to respect the office. Listen, look at Paul. They slapped him in the face when he called the, the, the high priest uh, a whitewashed sepulcher. And the guy, he was slapped. He said, oh, I forgot. I, I didn't know that this was the high priest that was speaking to me. See, he respected the authority of the high priest and he wasn't exactly a nice guy. He respected the office because God put him in that office. Pay attention what I'm telling you. This is something that Christians are losing sight of respect for authority in this country. So we have this situation here. Well, so I'm up there and I, I, do, I, I sing for the president and they, somebody snapped the picture and put it right in our foyer, which I had no problem with, but... Somebody goes, I'll never forget this, and God did it on purpose. He said, you see? They asked, no, where, what's this? Where's he singing here? He says, oh, he was, and there, everybody in the congregation was proud of it, and they was like, oh, you know, he was singing for President Bush in his re-election. They asked him to sing. And they, and they go, oh, do you have to be a Republican to join this church? And I looked at the person, absolutely, you can be anything you want politically. You can be independent, libertarian, I don't really care. Democrat, Republican, and that's very important, it's been said to me, because if somebody hears my political view and it's they have a contrary political view and they don't come to my church 
our church because of my political views, I've just put a stumbling block in the face of a person hearing the gospel. Let me repeat that. If I'm my political views and they hear them at the pulpit and they hear my political views and then they don't come to the church, they don't want to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is my job is to give them the gospel, right? They don't want to hear it. I've just put my political views become a stumbling block to those people hearing the gospel. So you have to make a decision. I, yeah, do I have the right to give my political views? Absolutely. The First Amendment, I believe it all. Absolutely. I believe in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Of course I do. Great, great idea. Wow. A lot of biblical principles there. But I'm not going to use my views. I'm not going to publicly pronounce my views. I'm going to sacrifice the expression of my views publicly so that the gospel would not be hindered. It would not be hindered from people hearing it. So important, people. You know, and this goes to every Christian. We need the gospel's got to be the issue. You know, because again, why? You know, the gospel's the only thing. What are, what are politics? You know, the Democrats, the Republicans, the, uh, the independents, whatever political view, the communists, the socialists, whatever they're trying to do, they think that their ideology or political view can, or political views can solve the problems in our country. Are you kidding me? The problems in our country children being murdered by crazies walked into schools and they they murder innocent children who were supposed to be going to school just to go to school and learn now they have to look over their shoulder and wait some crazy gunman is going to come in and blow them all away we have that going on you think you think a political view is going to stop that you think it's going to solve the problem in our country it's not it's not going to solve the problem okay uh, whatever the uh, problems with the with the um, sociological, economic, political, environmental, only the gospel can save this, this country and nation and any country and nation and group of people. Because the reason why we have all these economic and political and social and uh, problems going on and environmental problems because we're under a curse. We're, it's because of, we're enslaved to sin and Satan and only the gospel, faith in the gospel can deliver us from del enslavement to sin and Satan and eternal condemnation. It's only the gospel. All these things don't, you're looking, people in politics are trying to, you know, they, they, I mean, there's nothing wrong with politics. I'm saying, what I mean is don't think that that's going to be equal to the gospel. It's not, it's not even close. The gospel's the power of God for salvation. That's what the world needs today. That's what that gunman needed who killed those kids needed. Okay? That's, we, that's what our kids need. That's what everybody needs. Black, white, a woman, a man, I don't care who you are, Democrat, Republican, black, white, Indian, Portuguese, I don't know, whatever you are, whatever language you are, we all need the gospel. And that's the only thing that can save this country. Jesus is our only hope. So therefore, these, these back to our study, these three, and I just gave you some application there, by the way. Therefore, these three examples, which are presented in Jude 5 through 7, serve as a warning to the Christian community in Judea, that they must continue to adhere to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles and reject the attempts of these zealots to join them in their rebellion against Rome. Now, we must also remember that like the Exodus generation, the Christian community in Judea need not worry about experiencing eternal condemnation and the eternal lake of fire because both groups were declared justified through faith in the Lord. Rather, and this is true for us as Christians in the 21st century, they should fear facing the Lord's discipline and loss of rewards at the Bama seat if they're seduced into following the zealots in their rebellion against Rome, which was ultimately, as we pointed out, against the Lord Jesus Christ. Furthermore, it's extremely important that the, you and I understand that these three examples, which appear in Jude verses 5 through 7, are designed to emphasize with the Christian community in Judea the dire and terrible consequences of rebelling against the Lord. Each of these three examples are by no means designed to show them how the sins of the Exodus generation the fallen angels of the antediluvian period and the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, correspond to the sins of the zealots. No, the emphasis is not on the type of sins these individuals committed unrepentantly, which led to the Lord judging them, but rather, in these verses, the emphasis is upon the fact that they all rebelled against the Lord and not the manner in which they rebelled. In fact, Herbert Bateman IV points out these unregenerate Jewish zealots and I'm quoting from him, were concerned about marital fidelity. And yet, as the movement expanded, they too, according to Josephus, yielded to sexually immoral, immoral behavior, end of quote. So, Jude 5, as we pointed out, asserts 
that the sins of the Exodus generation, which was unrepentant unbelief, after their justification by faith. Now, does that mean they didn't get involved in sexual immorality? Yes, they did. We know that from the golden calf episode. But uh, theirs was unrepentant unbelief. The Lord makes that clear. That's why they're not going in. That's because they sent the reconnaissance, the 12 spies, and only Joshua and Caleb came out came, and their families came back with a good report. The other 10 spies gave a bad report because they didn't believe. They didn't believe the Lord had, would be with them as they took the, the, uh, the land of the Canaanites and dispossessed them. Their lack of faith is what caused God to say, no, you're not going in. In fact, you're all going to die in this wilderness. Your children are going to go in. Because you didn't believe and you think I was going to mistreat your children. Guess what? Your children are going to go in and you're going to die here in this desert. That's what he said to them. Now Jude 6, as we pointed out, also asserts that the sins of the fallen angels during the interdiluvian period was possessing the bodies of unregenerate men in order to have sex and procreate with unregenerate women in order to prevent the incarnation of the Son of God. And then lastly, Jude 7 asserts that the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the cities around them, were engaged in homosexual activity. Two of the examples are related to sexual sins, but the Exodus generation is unrepentant unbelief, as we pointed out. However, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them was homosexuality, which was not the sin of the fallen angels. Their sin, again, was leaving the realm which God ordained for the angelic race in order to cohabitate with the female members of the human race through a, a possession of men's bodies. All the sins in which each of these three groups committed unrepentantly did in fact manifest their rebellion against the Lord. Thus, it is better to understand Jude 5-7 through as examples of the consequences of rebelling against the Lord which these unregenerate Jewish zealots were doing by attempting to bring in the kingdom of God independently of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we, uh, as uh, Prophet Samuel said to uh, Samuel, uh, Prophet Samuel said to uh, King Saul when God uh, took away the kingdom from him because he didn't uh, obey him and wipe out, exterminate the Amalekites. Prophet says, Samuel says to him, for rebellion is like the sin of divination and presumption is like the evil of idolatry because you have rejected the word of Lord. He has rejected you as king. When it says in, in verse 22, Samuel said to him, does, Samuel said, does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as he does in obedience? Certainly obedience is better than sacrifice. Paying attention is better than the fat of rams. Pay attention, Christian. We need to obey God. And uh, this is what the message is. Do not rebel. And we sin. When we sin, and it doesn't matter what the sin, it could be homosexual behavior, it could be uh, murder, it could be lying, it, whatever, being unethical, unethical practices in your job, whatever the sin is, that's rebellion against the Lord. As a Christian, what we need to do is confess those sins and then do what the Spirit's teaching us in the Word of God. That constitutes repentance for a Christian. And if you're an unbeliever, not a Christian, repentance is trust, in, change your mind about Jesus, that's what repent means. Change your mind about Jesus and that lead, repentance leads to a change in conduct and behavior, which is what we want is obedience. So change your attitude about Jesus and trust in Him as Savior. He loves you. He sent this, He went to the cross for you and I, us sinners, the entire human race, past, present, and future, when we were His enemies. He suffered the wrath of God in our place so that we wouldn't suffer the wrath of God in the lake of fire forever. So again, rebellion is like the sin of divination and presumption is like the evil idolatry. And so because these Jewish zealots rejected the Lord and His teaching, they were judged severely by the Lord. And now they, they're presently uh, experiencing eternal condemnation in torments and eventually the lake of fire when their sentence is executed at the great white throne judgment with every unrepentant, unregenerate person in history, past, present, and future, Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Well, we'll pick this up Sunday and we'll, we'll go move on now to verse 8 of this great epistle and the great message of this epistle. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson be a great blessing in the body of Christ, bringing glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ, ministering to your people and any people in the audience that are not yet Christians. And so we pray for these things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.